Good afternoon and welcome to the Golf Business Conference sponsored by the NGCOA. My name is Lynette Carty and it's a pleasure to be with you today. I am the Director of Inclusion and Community Engagement for the PGA of America. And today I'll be discussing the inclusion guidelines for golf facilities. But first, let me share a little bit about myself. I went to the University of Connecticut undergrad, I'm a Connecticut native, and went to Western New England College for graduate school. Later, I became a language certified international flight attendant for Delta Airlines. I met my husband on a flight, married, divorced, moved back home, and became a television host for NBC, our local affiliate, also became a columnist for the local newspaper, The Hartford Current, and spent most of my career working in education at the Connecticut State Department of Education in the area of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Along the way, I've done a few other things as well, including working for the Village for Families and Children as a senior director of uh, their educational programs. And then I did a short stint with a small tech firm as the vice president of marketing. All of those talents have brought me here to the PGA of America where I've been for almost five years and I absolutely love what I do. So the inclusion guidelines for golf facilities really is something that I'm passionate about and I was pushed to write this because of all of my visits to numerous golf courses. And over the years, I will tell you that everyone knows that it is the power of the invitation that starts you off in loving this great game. My power of invitation started back in when I was in college. My first invitation to the game was from a professor. He invited myself and three other students and I had a big crush on one of the guys that he invited. So of course I said, yes, I wanna go, knowing I didn't know anything about golf. Well, sure enough, I got out there and I did better than I expected. They were actually sort of chiding me saying, well, this had, couldn't have been your first time. And I'll be honest with you, I haven't done as well since. And what was great about being out there is I fell in love, not with the guy, but with the game. And so, you know, I always tell that story when people ask, what was your first experience? And we know that that's what golf is about, right? It's about those great experiences that we have and you want people to walk away with something memorable, with a great story that they are going to share with friends and get them to come out and enjoy the game as well. So we can talk a little bit about the barriers to the game. We definitely know that time is probably one of the biggest barriers. You know, it's hard to carve out times for 18 holes, sometimes only for nine, but time is definitely a factor. We know that cost is definitely a factor. And of course, the intimidation of the game. I was embarrassed to go out the first time. And you know, the second time when I proved that I really didn't know anything about the game, that showed me that, you know, the intimidation factor, I had to get over that. I also had to beat that comp that competitive spirit that I have, you know, to just enjoy the game, but you can't help it. You still want to do better than the last time you were out there, right? So I wrote these guidelines hoping that. This will help you ask yourself the important questions on what you can do to make your facility better and more welcoming for all. So the first thing you will need to do is to carve out some time. And this is a group activity. The guide really is just an assessment tool for you to go through the questions in each one of the categories and just you know answer them. So carve out two hours for you and your staff you can divvy up the categories and really have fun. When I say a diversity lens, what I'm asking for you to do is really to look through a lens of who you are not. So if you're an able-bodied white male, try looking at it through the eyes of someone with a disability or a Latina like me, I'm half Latina and half black. My mom's Cuban and my dad's Jamaican or look at it through the eyes of, of an elderly person or someone who is really, really young. Try to put on a lens that is different from yours. And then when it comes to answering those questions, I can't emphasize it enough. 
let's face it, we all know what our facilities are like, what improvements are sort of need to be made and what doesn't. You really already know that, but this is just gonna shine a light so that you can really openly talk about these answers. And when you're finished, that's what you're going to do. The best part about this assessment tool, there's no scoring. There's no need to score. What you need to do is to sort of look at the things that are going great and give yourselves a pat on the back and then look at those things that you know need some improvements and then work towards making those improvements happen, right? So the four categories are marketing and communications, policies and practices, the physical environment, and a welcoming staff. And I'd like to go through just a few questions in each one of these categories so that you can see how important these are. And they are probably things that you just never really thought of. But first, let's take a look at this short video. Do you remember your first day of school or your first job or when you moved into a new neighborhood and you didn't know anybody? Do you remember those little feelings, those little murmurings of being a little insecure, a little like, huh, I wonder what's going to happen next? Yeah, well, it happens to everybody. So here's the cool thing. We're going to be talking about casual conversation today. Why? Because whenever you're doing casually, same muscles as when the stakes are really high. An important conversation, an important speaking event. So let's take the example of welcoming new people. Now, just like the golden rule reminds us, you do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you've ever experienced being awkward like that, first day of school, don't know if anyone's going to like you, it's really weird, you don't know what to do. Well, I want you to flip the script. I want you to look for opportunities to welcome people. I want you to look for ways that you can be proactive in your communication to make somebody feel better. So let's say with your work, and now maybe you aren't in charge of the welcome wagon at work, but you realize that there's a new employee that's somewhere you know, on your floor. I want you to go out of your way, even though it's not part of your job description or you maybe haven't thought of it before, but I want you to take proactive steps to introduce yourself by greeting somebody in a warm manner, by just sharing your name, by asking them some questions, maybe thinking about how you wish, information that you wish that you had, and then giving it freely. See, when you do that, when you start to step in the way you wish that people would have treated you, you, you start to change things. You start to make people feel better. And you start to step into a new, positive, confident version of yourself. Welcoming new people is a terrific opportunity to practice this. Whether it's a new person at your job, or you're just meeting somebody new at a networking event, or you're talking to somebody new in line at a coffee shop. Same stuff. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And guess what? You'll also start to notice that people are responding to you a little bit differently. Funny, but it works. So try that. When we get comfortable speaking in casual conversations, again, we are prepared for the big time. So practice now. Make somebody's day. It'll feel great for both you and for them. So I really love that video because she talks a lot about, you know, being welcoming and how important that is and how you treat others the way you want to be treated. And I'll never forget many years ago, I tell this story often, um, you know, I was working for the Village for Families and Children at that time, and I was in our local stop and shop supermarket and I'm in line with, you know, my groceries and I got a big cart and someone bumped me from behind. And it was sort of a, a what I call a inappropriate body bump, like a full body bump. So I slowly turn around with my face kind of like, who would do that? And then I see, and I could hear the boy saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And it was a much elderly man. And so I turned around and I said, that, that's okay, don't worry about it. But by the time I could turn back around, he full body bumped me again. So I turned back around to him and I said, sir, if you bump me like that one more time, you and I are going to be in a relationship and I'm going to have to take you home to meet my father. 
So I look down, he's laughing, I'm laughing, the cashier's kind of got a smirk on her face, like, mm, I don't know if that was so good, this man bouncing his whole body on you. He's got a really small basket, so, sir, get in front of me, I've got a big cart, sir, please, get in front of me. And he's like, no, no, finally he gets in front of me, and now he's engaging me in conversation, right? What's your name? I say it. Where do you work? I say it. What do you do? I work with kids who are you know, neglected, abused, they're up for adoption or foster care, and, you know, gone through traumatic things. And, uh, you know, we're having this conversation. But while we're having this conversation, I'm really looking at him, right? He has got to be maybe late 80s, early 90s. He uh, is not really dressed well. He looks like, you know, I didn't want to say that he might be living on the street, but his clothes were so dirty, I really couldn't imagine someone that elderly still working. When I looked at his hands, he goes to pay, and he's got dirt under his fingernails. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, I feel so sorry for this man. So he goes to pay, and he's missing, like, 75 cents, whatever, and he's digging in his pockets. So I say, sir, sir, I've got it. Don't worry about it. And he's like, no, no. I said, sir, I've got it. You know, I give the girl the change. And now he's asking me for my business card. Are you going to give me your business card? <laughs> I, you know, I smiled. I said, sure. And you know, I dig and I find my business card and I give it to him. And he says, you know, have a great day. You were so nice. I said, not a problem. And I knew, I knew as soon as he stepped out of that line and walked away, I knew that the cashier was going to say something. And sure enough, you know, I started to put my groceries up and she says, I can't believe you gave your card to that dirty old man. And, and all I could think of was, you know, I, I hope that it, you know, I'm that age and you better hope when you're that age that you're not still working. Because I think he's still working. I think that's that's why he's dirty. And, and she said, I guess you're right. So I leave and I don't think anything else about this man. About three weeks later, the CEO of the company calls me in. And he said, who's, you know, like Vinnie Papalardo? And I said, I, I don't know who that is. He says, you don't know Vinnie Papalardo? And I said, no, I, I don't. He said, and he's reading from a card. I bumped into her in Stop the Shop. And I was like, mm. I literally bumped into her twice in Stop the Shop. I was like, I know exactly who that is. I know exactly who that is. And he says, well, he, he was so impressed with you. And you treated him so nice. He sent a $50,000 donation to your program. And all I could think of was, I should have took him home to meet my dad, right? You never know. So here it is. I'm in line, and I made all of these assumptions about this man based on his age, based on his cleanliness, based on you know his inability to pay for the change for his groceries. He's one of the richest men in Connecticut and owns one of the largest construction companies there. He was probably out on the construction site that day. So that taught me a lot. And um, I hope that story resonates for you because you never know who you're going to meet. You never know who you welcome in your facility or who you meet in the line at a stop and shop that might become a new member of your facility and bring other members with them. So let's go through the first chapter. Marketing and communications is so vital. You really want to take a good look at your print, your digital, your social, any promotional materials that you have, all of these things are who speak to your membership and to your guests. So in print, you know, would you look, when you look at it, what do you see? You know, you want to ask yourself those questions. In digital, who are you trying to reach? And who actually gets all your things socially? Who are your friends on social media? Who, do, who have you invited to be your friends on social media? And who do you follow? So we want to take a, a closer look by let's go through a couple of the questions so that you have a better idea on the scope of this. So one of the first questions I would ask are, all your materials clear, concise, and understandable? Oftentimes we use terms that sometimes people who are non-golfers, they don't understand. Have you had non-golfers and non-staff members review them? That's the perfect time to really get people who, you know, have a different lens, like we talked about earlier, to help you decipher and find out those gaps, what you're missing, what you're not, you have. Next question. 
do you see imagery and stories about women from all backgrounds? So we want to be seen. We're women. And I remember the very first time when I walked into the PGA of America, um, the lobby, I saw all of these massive pictures of male golfers. And all I could think of was, where are the women? Because women play golf and we should be up there too. So use that eye, use that different lens and see what you're missing. And not just women, but women from all backgrounds. Ask yourself, do we have you know, same-sex couple imagery? Do we have people with disabilities imagery? Next, is there information and incentives on bringing new people to the facility? What sort of either events are you having and what does your outreach look like to bring new membership in? I will tell you that outreach to local churches, to the alumni chapters of sororities and fraternities, especially those for people of color, those are really active. They're people with deep pockets and most of them really love the game of golf. And then my next question is, do you host these unique events geared towards diverse populations? And that means everyone, women, do you, you know, gear them towards you know, individuals with disabilities, veterans, maybe even English language learners. I did a session out in California and they actually did an event that was mostly geared towards the Asian community. And they ended up getting 42 new memberships. Who would have known? So these are the types of things that I want you to think about when you go through the marketing and communication section. There are many more questions for you to go through and just try, as I said, to put a different lens as you go through these questions. So the next category is physical environment. And by physical environment, we mean both the interior and the exterior. You want to be sure to look at, you know, parking and signage and tees and the merchandise shop because all of those things we become sort of complacent with once we know it. Like Sandhill Crane has, you know, I love their sign because you can see it, it's visible from the road. And even if you're not a golfer, you can tell somebody where that is because you see the sign. There's a couple of places that I've been to. I went to 32 uh, sections last year, 32 places to deliver content. And a couple of them, it was difficult for me. If it wasn't for the GPS getting me there, I'd still be looking. No signage at all, not really a place where to turn in. You know, uh, these things are sort of important, but when we already know them, we just, you know, we're sort of insensitive to it. So let's go through some of the questions here. Are there visible and clearly stated directions as you enter the facility's grounds for all types of parking and drop-off? So members and guests, you know, is it accessible for people with disabilities? If there's a motor coach with a group of young children coming, are all these things sort of labeled clearly so that people know where they have to go? Two, are the facility's hours of operation posted at or near the front entrance and all other entrances? So that means, you know, for people who frequent the club, they know. But what about somebody who's a newbie who might be passing by and they see that sign? It's great for them to know that, wow, if they get off work at 5, they don't wrap up until 8.30. I think I can get in nine holes I can come, right? Are the accessible only entrances clearly marked and fully accessible? Oftentimes, the accessible entrances are accessible with a ramp to enter the building, but once you've entered the building, it's a little bit difficult to navigate. So you want to really take the time to have someone go through measure with what is it like in your merchandise shop? Can someone really navigate that with ease if they um, are using a wheelchair to get around? Does the course have language that is inclusive? For example, forward tees as opposed to women's tees. We like that word forward tees because it makes us feel um, just as competitive as the men who are out there. And we, we want to feel like we're engaged and you know, we we're vested in the game just like man is. And we know we may not be as strong, but we still feel it in our heads, right? So think about all of those things. Also for the interior, you know, you want to think about cleanliness. It means a lot, 
I pulled up to a couple of places where the parking lot had, you know, some debris and the restroom was not as clean as it should have been. So you want to really make sure that you ramp up and have your staff do their walkthroughs every two to three hours to make sure that you are presenting visually what you want to seem as welcoming and be as welcoming for everyone. Policies and practices. So your facility's policies and practices can either enhance or undermine a welcoming and inclusive atmosphere. And, you know, lots of these policies really aren't known to sometimes even the members, much less new golfers. And so these are sometimes things that you should share either when you have some sort of in introduction into membership, or if you're going to have um, the basic lessons, you can include that just so people know and, and go through all the rules, go through everything, the things that you think are sort of commonplace that people should know, they often don't know. The style of dress, how to carry yourself, you know, being sort of um, socially, you know, you want people to socially enjoy themselves, but you also want them to be socially quiet and to have respect for other people that are out on the course. And there is nothing wrong with sort of saying that to people, especially new people that come that might not be aware. And sometimes it's even great to reinforce that message for those members who are already there. Some of the questions and policies and practice include, do you have specific information available to visitors, new members, and families that include the tea times, the events, the instructional programs, and the costs? These are the things that I think are sort of that carrot on a stick to get people to come. And oftentimes, yes, women are attracted to women's events, we want to come and, you know, um, have camaraderie with each other. But also the instructional programs are important. I always want to sort of ramp up my game. And I will take like the same type of lesson over and over to make sure my swing is good. Now I'm more into the short game. Cause <laughs> no short game at all. So I'm always trying to get instructions on that. And, you know, make sure that these are things that people don't have to ask for that it is sort of out there with your promotional materials. Another question is, does your family membership include same-sex couples? You know, I've, I've gotten a lot of questions about that uh, in some of my sessions. Like, how do we handle that? What are the answers? And I think we all know that we want to be equitable in our practices. And so if you have a same-sex couple come, you want to treat them just like you would any other couple. And they will steer you into the language to use. Um, if they are openly gay, they will share that with you. If they are not and it's inferred, welcome that and just go with it. Guardians. Lots of times now we have, you know, children that want to get involved in golf, but they're actually not being raised by their parents. They might be raised by a grandparent or by an aunt or an uncle. And you want to honor that sort of multi-generational household and make sure that they feel welcome to the game. Make sure that, you know, they have a good time and, and help promote that. Make sure that you connect them with a PGA professional for lessons and um, sort of take the next step for them so that they, they're wrapped around the game, right? We all know how to do that. The next question do you have meaningful and active connections with local social groups, schools, churches, sororities and fraternities, diverse chambers of commerce and civic organizations for recruitment? So, you know, earlier I mentioned the alumni chapters of sororities and fraternities, especially for people of color. They're really, really active. I would also steer you towards the diverse chambers of commerce. Uh, the PGA is really um, vested in making sure that, number one, we bring all the diverse chambers together well, where we have our championships, for example, right? We have a vendor match. And we make sure that the Latino chamber, the African-American chamber, the, N, uh, the, um, the NGLCC, which is the National Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce, and so on, are all involved in that process. 
so that they get a piece of the championships. And we actually have that vendor match program where we bring these chambers together and introduce these smaller companies, these tier two and tier three companies with our tier one companies so that they get a piece of the pie. You can be doing the same thing with these chambers. When you have your events, you want to you know, make sure that you get your, your chambers involved and invite them. You also want to involve other small businesses when you're having things catered. You know, you can have a different taste of the, the taste of the course, right? So I'm telling you, this these are just some of the smaller things that you can do to make your, your facility more welcoming and some things that you can do to engage some groups that you typically might not have engaged before. So let's move on to the last section, which I think is truly you know, the most important section. And sometimes it takes a little bit of a hump for us to get over that because why? Because we all have our own bias. We all, we all come with our own unconscious bias. And sometimes it's hard to really look at that bias and say, I wanna look past it, whatever it might be. And, and you all know what your own bias is. I'll be brave here and I'll share um, my bias with you um, because I've tried to move myself past it. So my bias is I am biased against kids who dress in goth clothing, G-O-T-H, goth clothing. They typically will dye their hair deep purple or deep black. They're covered with tattoos. They wear black nail polish. Uh, sometimes even have tattoos on their face. Uh, will wear a, you know, a floor length leather coat when it's 200 degrees outside. And I think you've got a shotgun under there, right? So I, I have a bias towards it and I, I'm fearful of it, fearful of those kids. And about two years ago, I was going to present at a section and I checked into the hotel, I got in the elevator and just as the elevator door was about to close, a hand came in. And I could see from the black nail polish and the tattoos, I immediately grabbed my suitcase like, oh, I forgot something at the check-in counter. Let me go back. But I stopped myself. I stopped myself in the moment. And I said, Lynette, either you're going to die on your way to the ninth floor or you're going to make it. <laughs> so the kid gets in the elevator and he says, what floor, ma'am? Ma and I'm like, oh, my gosh, he manned me. Like, that's so manageable. Like, I didn't expect that. And then I, I could hardly get it out. I'm a nine, and I say nine, and he pushes it. And then I notice he pushes seven for himself. And secretly, um, I'm thinking, oh, he's getting off before me. I just might make it. So he gets to the, the seventh floor now, and he turns around and he says, have a nice day, ma'am. I felt this big. I felt this big. So... I get to my room, and the first thing I do is I go and look it up. Like, what is it with goth kids, and why am I so fearful? And, you know, I, I felt awful because the children that dress like that are typically the kids who are bullied, they are made fun of, they're tortured, and they do that to keep people away from them. They oftentimes hurt themselves, cut themselves, and have been suicidal. So... You know, we might hear the stories of one or two because they have a shotgun and shoot up a, you know, have a school shooting. It's because they have gone through so much trauma. This is how they have sort of backlash. So I have a whole different um, opinion on kids who dress in golf clothing. And I would encourage you to do the same. You know, a, a young black man put me in check not too long ago. I saw him at one of our PGA championships during our Beyond the Green event, and he is brilliant. He got a full ride scholarship to Harvard and what just a smart young man. And here it is seven months later, I'm back there in North Carolina and I see him at a mall. He recognizes me. And he comes running over to me, hugs me, whatever. And, and all of a sudden, I look down and he's got his pants hanging down low. And I'll be honest, I don't like it. I have a bias against that. I cannot stand when young men wear their pants hanging down low. 
And so before he walked away, I got his attention and I said, I, I just have to share this with you. You're going to Harvard, you're a smart kid. I know you're gonna do well, but you really shouldn't be wearing your pants hanging down low. And he said to me, Miss, I don't like wearing my pants hanging down low either, but because of the neighborhood I live in, I'll get beat up on the way home if I don't sort of conform to the culture. So anytime you're sort of faced with your bias, ask yourself one, why you have the bias, and number two, have you really checked it, right? Have you really checked yourself to see why? And so same here with the welcoming staff. And by welcoming, we know who we welcome. We welcome who we think is most like us. And there's nothing wrong with that. But you also want to make sure that you and your staff, that you have the essential elements in creating a welcoming atmosphere. You want every person who interacts with your staff members to be treated the way you would like to be treated, regardless of their race, age, gender, identity, culture, religion, sexual orientation, ability, or background. So let's go through these questions. Does the staff greet all members and guests with the same sense of urgency, a smile, and in a friendly and courteous way as if they were greeting their best friend or their own family member? You want to encourage your staff members to do so. And believe me, people can tell when it's genuine and when it's not genuine. You also want to make sure, does your staff answer the telephone in a friendly and professional way? Are they patient? with those who are less proficient with the English language or have difficulty hearing. You know, I'll never forget the first time my mom came up to, to school to pick me up early. I was a little sick when I was a kid. I went to Catholic school and I remember one of the, the nuns saying like, I don't understand you, I don't understand what you're saying and saying it kind of loud and mean. And you know, my mother's English was very good. She just had a heavy, Spanish accent. So no one sort of wants to feel like they're on the periphery. You want to take your time with them and, and be gentle with them and be welcoming. Do staff members know how to address inappropriate language or behavior and feel confident in doing so? Sometimes that's really, really, it's really tough, right? Um, and especially when it's uh, something that is generationally different, you might have a young staff member with an older member using inappropriate language. And sometimes they feel like they really can't say something, but I'll tell you one thing that I use and it works. I was raised like this. My father was really good with it. If we did anything that was out of place, all he did was clear his throat. <clears throat> Just like that. And it works. It, it really does work. So, you know, I would encourage you to at least share that with them. And then do staff members pass in the hallway? Do they acknowledge each other? Do they acknowledge guests with a smile or a nod or a hello? Just those small little things make all the difference in the world when you are trying to engage with your um, team to make sure that they make the facility more welcoming for everyone. A small nod, a warm hello, hey, how you doing? Even though you're still moving, you're not waiting for that long answer. It's just the acknowledgement that counts. And even if it's not a guest that you're making it with, when a guest sees that camaraderie between two staff members, they actually feel more welcome. They know that the staff gets along well, and if they're treating each other well, that they will probably treat me you know, the same way. So with these four chapters, again, there are a ton of questions. Take your time to go through them. Make sure that you, know, you answer them honestly and openly and then decide what can we change? And I guarantee you, most of the changes that you are going to make will not cost a dime. It will help you, it'll help your facility, and your facility will blossom. So if you have any questions, please email me at lcardi at pgahq.com. The PGA is committed to creating a game, an industry workforce, and a supply chain that mirrors America. I hope that you enjoy the Golf Business Conference and thank you so much for watching. And don't forget to download the guidelines for golf facilities on pga.org.
Thank you so much. And thank you to the NGCOA.